sin to die. There's something else on the ballot. Character. Character's on the ballot. Reason. And basic decency are on the ballot. Democracy itself is on the ballot. The stakes are high. 2024, most importantly, we are going to take back our magnificent, oh, so beautiful White House. We're going to take it back, and you're going to be hearing about it very soon. A thousand dollars to Mandela Barnes, who's running for the U.S. Senate in Wisconsin. Another thousand dollars to Senator Catherine Cortez Masto of Nevada, and five hundred dollars to Maryland congressional candidate Glenn Ivey. Green has helped to lead Huawei's lobbying team since 2019, when the company hired his law firm to lobby for its interests. And now over to sports news. Here's to co-op uh, religions, and that is what's going on here. On okay. here. And people want to deny it, that's fine. But okay, the but facts are very clear. I've studied okay. history all of my life. Okay. I've taught okay. history. And I'm telling you, what I see here are parallels to what the history was okay. uh, in this world uh, back in the 1930s so, in then, Germany, in Italy. Okay. Are, are voters, though, out there listening to this message to infer from what you're saying that if they don't vote for Democrats in this election, that they are somehow supporting something akin to the rise of Hitler? No, if they don't vote against election deniers, if they don't vote against liars, people who lie know full well they're lying, we all know they're lying. This was the cleanest election in the history of the country. Uh, Donald Trump's own uh, appointee said it was the cleanest in the history of the country. So if they're lying, they're denying, they're trying to delete, they're trying to nullify votes, vote against that foolishness. Okay, so Congressman, to look back on some of those conversations about election deniers, we've talked about on this show that Democrats have spent more than $40 million making sure that some of those people got through primary, um, GOP primaries, so that they could then face off in the general election. Do Democrats bear some responsibility for putting those people now on the ballot? No, we didn't put them up. But you those spent millions to get them there. I'm sorry? But you spent millions to get many of them there, where they are now on the general election ballot. Well, you know, I have read about that. I believe that you should always try to best position yourself to win in the general election. I'm not a proponent of that process. Uh, this major, since 1951, and that was actually at about parity of where we are now. But what you have to realize is we have much higher demand for diesel fuel today than we did in 1951. Uh, this should concern everybody in the shipping industry, the freight industry, trucking, uh, railroads. But look, I'm a farmer. Uh, my family's farming in eastern Montana. You can't produce food for this country without diesel fuel. Tractors, farm implements, they all run on diesel fuel. They've yet to create an electric-powered tractor with that, that you can grow food like we need to in this country. Uh, that just doesn't exist. So this is very concerning to anyone uh, in production, agriculture, in the shipping industry, in manufacturing. Uh, this is going to have tremendous ripple across our, our, our economy. Well, and one thing I've been asked also is, I mean, how many days do we have left? That report that came out that said 28 days was about two weeks ago. How many days do we have left? And why are we not hearing more about this? Like, what, what can we actually expect from this? Well, we can expect higher prices. I mean, I read a story this morning where, you know, basically over-the-road truck drivers are not making any kind of profit, uh, specifically your small over-the-road truck drivers that, that are their own independent businesses. They're making very little money. Uh, which has to beg the question, why keep doing it? Uh, and that's just going to further exacerbate our supply chain problems in this country. Truckers are the lifeblood of this country, and those trucks run on diesel fuel. They don't run on fairy dust and rainbows. We have to have diesel fuel to power this economy, to move commerce, to move goods across the country. Uh, again, they've yet to come up with a good electric-powered semi-tractor that can haul the kind of loads that we need hauled in our economy. Carl could into after she said this, by some deranged guy wielding a hammer. This is an essential part of their rhetoric from us. 
And again, if you research, 82% of black voters say violent crime is extremely important to them as an issue. And only 33% of white Democrats say that. But this is a party that cares about people of color. This is a party of compassion. This is a party of diversity, inclusion, equity. Not giving a rip about something that blacks and blacks overwhelmingly have voted for the Democratic Party care about. Here's more of these Democrats talking about defund the police. Again, this is not some fringe position. Even Joe Biden said, you know, we could probably redirect this and redirect that and do this. Here's some more. In some necessary cases, completely dismantling those police forces. Police departments uh, are taking a sizable uh, amount of the budget of a lot of municipalities and, and other entities. Uh, we need to look at those budgets, pull some of the money back, and invest it in other things. We are committed to shifting resources. Our call to defund the police have been met with resistance to stop investing so much money in this militarized police force and instead invest in the things our community really needs. Yes, I support a radical reimagining of community safety and public safety. I do believe that we need to reallocate resources away. And will this involve cuts? Yes, of course, to every department, including the police department. And so when we dismantle it, we get rid of that cancer. When we say defund the police, the world woke up. I, I really love that uh, Black Lives Matters and uh, other protesters have put this front and center to defund. Defunding police means defunding police. If these reports are accurate, then these proposed cuts to the NYPD budget are a disingenuous illusion. This is not a victory. The freshman Democrat adding the fight to defund policing will continue. We are going to reimagine policing in New York City. I think the idea of having a police free future is very aspirational. And I am willing to stand with community members who are asking us to think of that as the goal. Should be defunding or dismantling their police departments, such as in Minneapolis and, and New York. My answer is yes to that. We need to be looking at it clear. Which means reallocating um, and, and not further investing in a carceral state. Did Minneapolis politicians say a police-free future? She sure did. This, this movement, this front. And I think that what's changed is that um, a couple of things. Number one, you know, uh, Hispanics are proud Americans. And, you know, they have seen over the past few years this sort of um, subtle, not so subtle bashing of America by liberals. And they don't like it. Uh, and they're very proud to be uh, American, and they they want to move forward, and they want to be uh, they're patriotic, and uh, they want to you know fix their own home communities. And uh, I you know I think that nothing really describes that better than Meyer Flores' own campaign slogan, which is God, family, and country. And when you're talking about folks in South Texas, you have some people who are Tejanos who have been there for five generations or more, basically, before Texas was even Texas. And then you have newer immigrants like Myra Flora herself. But they're all very proud to be Americans, and uh, they see that their community is in trouble, their country is in trouble, and they want to, you know, uh, take leadership. As you mentioned, Myra Flores is campaigning on a slogan of God, family, and country, which are more conservative Republican values. If that's an accurate reflection of the of Hispanic Americans in general, why have they traditionally voted Democrat? Yeah, it, you know, it, you know, for an outside observer, it does seem a little bit confusing. But you know, once you know a little bit about the history and that. Uh, the Democrat Party was basically the only political party in town because the Republican Party really didn't have a, a very active presence in a South Texas at all. And it's really not until the late 80s, early 90s, where you even have the Republican Party really starting to move in there. Hispanics obviously aren't a monolith. So which element within them are shifting more toward the Republicans? I would say that um, certainly uh, you have the folks that are more rural in nature, and, and South Texas is a little bit more rural than urban. Uh, and uh, I would also say that the Hispanics that have been here longer are also uh, starting to step up and shift a little bit. 
Uh, and uh, but also, there's some new immigrants that are you know feel very strongly uh, that you know they've just become American citizens, and they're very concerned in what the direction this country is going. Uh, I think that all of it you know stems from basically you know kitchen table issues. You know, everybody needs jobs to put, you know, food on the table, clothes on their back, um, and, you know, and, and, and provide for a home. So that's number one concern. Uh, and, you know, and I would say, you know, we did at the Texas Public Policy Foundation a poll uh, in February of this year, and 68% of the Hispanics that we polled believed that inflation was caused by bad policy. And surprisingly enough, even 58% of Hispanic self-identified Hispanic liberals thought that inflation was caused by bad policies. So uh, you have a lot of people who are really actively thinking about what's, you know, what's happened, you know, and why is the economy and why is this country going, you know, in the direction that it is.